Hello, welcome to any attendees and welcome to um, all of these wonderful folks who have given us this precious thing of their time tonight for Artist, The Artist and the Vote, part two, a public conversation uh, uh, by uh, HB Studio and I'll be a, a, a moderator. But before we even go any further, I wanted to just introduce um, our artistic and executive director, Edith Meeks, just to share a little bit about what drew her to want to have this happen both the first time, which was, uh, I guess, a couple of days before election day. Um, and now, now for part two, uh, this thing called the artist and the vote, uh, Edith Meeks. Thank you. Um, and thank you, David, for agreeing to moderate this panel and to all our panelists for being here. Um, I, it's so odd because I feel like we are in a wholly different place than we were on November 1st, and that we've been in so many different places this year um, from day to day and month to month. Uh, but as the election came on, uh, I'd had some conversations about, and we'd had some feedback about whether or not um, artists should be political. We was kind of interested in, in that question and how that hits different people. And um, I was feeling very uh, urgent um, in relation to the political situation in the US uh, and, um, and also the cultural situation in US. I felt like uh, we're, we're at a time in history when things are upside down and, and how can I not in my art somehow engage with that? But I was also very interested to speak with other artists about their experiences, understanding that there are people in this country who are heard in different ways um, uh, and in different degrees. So I wanted to invite that conversation. So we got together on November 1st and um, uh, I found it extraordinary to hear from all of the people in the boxes here. And I, I feel like we all left that conversation feeling like we had more to say to each other and, and, uh, and to our audience. Um, and now here we are having had an election which has a very long tail and we're still kind of sorting out that. Um, and I, I, I don't know where I am. I, I have a question, where are we now? Um, where do we go from here? And how do we hold on to um, some very beautiful momentum that we found this year? Um, and how do we move into whatever this next space is? And once again, how how does that relate to what we do as artists? It, you know, how, how central is that to what you you do as an artist and uh, how do you find yourself um, how do you find those two parts of yourselves the citizen self and the um, and the artist self interacting now great great thank you so much Edith yeah this was I I, I, I it's an honor to to host uh, and moderate and and sort of facilitate people's responses. And I thought that tonight what we could do is just uh, two prompts. And the first one would just be uh, sort of just to break the ice, kind of like an you know, icebreaker, um, but uh, in a particular way. So I would invite everybody one at a time to, to sh if it's okay to share just two things, maybe just to, to um, maybe just to say uh, your your full name and place of birth, if, if, if like w w as far as specific as you know, when it comes to that, and then and this is weird. And if you don't think of anything, you could say something else or whatever you want. But I was actually wondering if there was a moment or two that pops up that you experienced uh, a specific moment or two uh, 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 that pops up that you experienced. Um, this past election day, um, that if there's anything that specifically uh, that you remember um, 
about this past election day. So your name, place of birth, and and if and just a moment if there's something you remember. And if not, I can't remember anything. It's a total blank. That's okay. Too. Whatever, whatever you want. So I'll I'll just start quick. I'll just say David Deblinger, born in Brooklyn Jewish Hospital, and. Um, I was debating whether I was gonna say this because I don't wanna make this all about uh, me and, and, and it, please let's not do that, but, but I'll say two things. One is unfortunately uh, on, on the election day was the day that I, that I buried my mother. And uh, and I uh, and we were so we were uh, heading to the the uh, you know the the cemetery and and um, but but the other moment that I wanted to bring up is that I looked on uh, Facebook on how you know how I I actually had voted early early uh, so I looked on Facebook and I saw these two very good friends of mine colleagues of mine David uh, Zayas and Liza Colon Zayas. And I hadn't looked at what was going on. It was earlier in the day. And they, the two of them had like their faces on a post, like right, they were sitting next to each other and they were like, and I knew what that meant. And it made me, and it meant that basically that the current guy was winning or, or was doing well earlier in the day. And I got really anxious. Magali. Hi, my name is Magali Kaliman Christopher. I was born in Brooklyn, New York. And um, the one thought that came to my mind was reality imitating fiction. Um, we co-produced Blue Light series with HB Studio and we closed on October 31st. And I wrote a play called I Married a Black Republican. And the play ends with a news reporter saying, um, the results are not, we haven't, won't be able to count the results by the end of today. We, we don't know when we will know. And so, and then the companion piece to my piece on the performance day was Juan's play customer voting service and the whole world changes 20 years from now because of the results of this election, the events surrounding this. So I was just like, oh, are we psychic? What? I mean, sure, they were saying because of the mail-in votes, there would be a delay, but there was like this big don 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 feeling at the end of my play and don 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 feeling in his play that the world's going to change because of 2020 election. And so I was feeling very stuck in Twilight Zone that day. Yeah. Thank very you much so much. So. Thank you so much. John Martin. Hey there. Um, John Martin Green, born in Bronx Hospital. Um, the moment I remember from election day um, might not have been election day because it was just as I was about to retire. Um, I had been watching the returns and between them, um, Steve Kornacki and John King on MSNBC and CNN respectively, um, were tallying the, the vote count up to that point. And uh, it was probably around midnight. And uh, they were saying that um, uh, Donald was ahead. And, um, but I made a point of not being anxious. I, I made a determination that I would not be anxious because um, in, in their very good reporting between them, both Kornacki and King were showing wherefore the precincts that were outstanding yet were um, all democratic territories, um, um, densely populated democratic territories 
where the um, the 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 that were mostly mail-in ballots and and the pre-vote, you know, the people who had voted early. That is, um, so I was fine, and I said, "Yeah, I'm, we, we're good. We're good." And I went to bed. <laughs> I wish I was with you at the time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, my name is Nyan Yenifin, uh, born in Trent, New Jersey. And uh, the one moment that comes to mind, uh, almost similar to uh, John and Martin, actually, um, you know, during election day, I pretty much made it yeah, a point not to look at any of the polls, what's going on. I was like, look, I put my two cents in. Hopefully that, you know, it's worth something. And I just wanted to go to sleep. But I had a friend of mine who was really into it. He called me. And he was telling me like play by play action. This guy had three monitors. He's like, yo, this is what's saying on CNN. This is what's saying on Fox News. This is what's saying on MSNBC. And he had it all. He had me more anxious than I probably could have been by myself. This dude had three screens with like each map. And he was like cross comparing and looking at things during last election. So I went to sleep anxious. Um, but you know, I was like, all right, hopefully I wake up and it's done. And I wake up, results still ain't done. So I'm still awake anxious and i was pretty mad about that to be honest i just wanted to be done over with here's the results i move on with my life but it's that anxiety stressed out for a week and i was <laughs> i was not happy about that thank you lorraine hi i'm lorraine i was born um in Quezon city manila philippines um I'll be honest, I don't really remember specific moments from that day. I um, I was drinking, but it was just the whole week was a blur, you know. Um, but I, I, the feelings I remember um, and starting from election day, um, I knew the feeling was that even if there was, a, I think, the professionals called it a red mirage or something um, where, you know, it took days for the mail-in ballots to come in, but yeah, it's likely that Biden's going to win, etc. Even with the red mirage and um, Biden possibly winning later on, it's still the results, the fact that it wasn't a blowout, like, some very hopeful people predicted um, was pretty bad news. Um, and I mean, we're seeing it now, people are fighting results um, and the integrity of this country's democracy, um, as much integrity as it had before uh, is, is kind of dwindling away. Um, so just not great. That's what I get from the election day, not great. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you. Um, Juan. Hey, um, thank you. I'm, I'm Juan Ramirez Jr. I was born in a infamous Lincoln Hospital in the Bronx. Um, and uh, my uh, experience, much of like, um, I know he was talking about, about the uh, Blue Light series and about having that sort of experience of like, well, we did this work and, um, you know, it's kind of screaming at us in a way where it's like, oh, did we predict this, right? And I had that, but also a touch of like heartbreak. I kind of think of myself like, oh, let me write this piece, but I don't want it to happen. I want to look like the crazy writer that came up with it, not the, oh, you had a, uh. so that was interesting to me. Um, but I was also very, um, for a lot of us Potriqueños on this side, we were also having another sort of vote for the statehood. And, um, and that sort of, I, I won't get into that about whether, because there are many different opinions about whether they should or not, but that was also happening. And I thought how American that was. I'm sort of on this tip of how American is that, right? That we're, we're fighting to hold this and then yet my little island over there is fighting to have anything. And I thought, how American is that? And um, that was sort of my 
experience. Yeah, if that makes sense. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, Abhishek? Um, hi, everyone. Um, my name is Abhishek Cha. I was born in New Delhi, India. Um, I don't know the name of the hospital. Um, one of the spe specific moments I remember is um, I saw like a pickup truck with a big American flag in the back of it. And uh, it was written like uh, it was like full of "Make America Great Again" and those uh, bumper stickers. And um, I mean, I, I'm my thought process works the way like I'm not really uh, very anxious about if Trump com comes to power or not because as as I shared the last time, I see these things as waves. Uh, from right to left, the uh, from political right to political left, the 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 pendulum of the time swings. It cannot stay at one point. If it's too extreme to one point, it's it's bound to go to the other other point at some time. So I, I from a long term perspective, I don't get anxious. But I was just thinking, like for that moment, like um, like people, like there are almost half of the country uh, like half and half of the country are like so opposing to each other in terms of how they see things and in terms of how they how they perceive so i was like whatever the the result will be of the election i mean i mean what would be the immediate repercussions which thankfully nothing happened but that was something I was thinking about, like the immediate repercussions of the results of the election. Thank you. Thank you, Abhishek. Edith? I was born in Memphis, Tennessee. Don't know the name of the hospital either. Um, my dad was a university pastor at the time. We were only there for a couple of years before we moved on. Um, and election day, I don't remember it that well either, actually. I, I, what I remember is a week of being glued to the radio um, and my cell phone results and taking it to bed with me and, um, and, the, and being really um, arrested by the by the numbers, the 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 numbers on both sides really um, uh, took me by surprise, uh, and and the sense that this was this wasn't going to be a win; it was going to be a grind. It's going to be a long. It's it's a long grind. Um, and where do you, you know, Thank you. where you pick up with that? I didn't mean to cut you off. Um, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so uh, just, just a, a reminder of, of just a couple of questions that Edith had brought for or, or thought about for today. One was just, where are we now? Another was, where do you find yourself? And uh, another was, where do we go from here? And another was, how do you respond to this moment as an artist? If I can, maybe I'll try to um, see if I can copy and put those into the into our little chat. Am I able to do that for us to see or or or? Uh, Lauren, is that? Yeah, is, of course. You can do that, okay. Um, I'll see if it works. Sometimes it doesn't work. Let's see. Um, so I'll put that there, and then, and then, basically, what I'm thinking now for anybody watching, and I think I've already told you guys, is is uh, those questions are there. Um, I'm sort of going to open it up uh, with my style of prompt, which is kind of similar to what the first thing I just told you, because I love. I love inviting people to share moments of experience that 
pop up in their mind like spontaneously if they're comfortable sharing it because I find the things that pop up in our mind you know have meaning and and it shows when if, if it's something people are comfortable sharing but you don't have to stick to that you could also go with these questions or really uh, a stream of, of consciousness uh, really whatever I was hoping everybody could probably keep it to maybe uh, three, three to four minutes, I think, uh, uh, so, something like that, or, or less if, if you if you if you want. And I was gonna uh, and I was gonna start by just mentioning. Um, well, first thing I was gonna mention as an as an artist, I'm I, I I mean I'm somebody who is I guess you'd call a performance artist, and I've been creating work for a number of years, and also writing, but struggling with the discipline to really do that, and I've. I'm working on a new project and I find what's so interesting about writing and, and even poetry or even play is, is, the, is the intent to both find and explore truth in an economic way and, and whether you can put how much you can pack into the least amount of words. Um, so anyway, I've been reading a script called Fleabag, which is the original one woman show that this woman who's gained such notoriety did for her series. But the actual script, I, I'm, 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 in, I'm really loving it, uh, reading it several times. And uh, for that reason, the economic truth. And uh, that's just one thing I was gonna say, it like, so as far as the search for so-called truth. But when I think of truth, I think of what's resonant for me, what has meaning to me. I don't think of black and white facts. I think of what I care about and what pops up in my mind or in my dreams um, or in my memory. Um, so one prompt uh, that I'm gonna offer to you uh, in my style, which is, which is again, this idea of like invite, inviting you to think of a moment that pops up in your mind from your life that might kind of encapsulate the both the personal and the political. If there's anything that that's come up, so this is just one one thought. I, I I'm definitely a fan of of work of any kind artistically to feel personal. Not that it has to be personal, you know, like autobiographical, um, uh, but but that it has sort of this in my mind. That's something that I. That, so anyway, so, so, but if I were to think of, of two moments um, that pop up in mind that feel a little like a mixing personal and political, I'll try to be short. The, the, I, I, uh, a couple of months ago, I mean, I, I, I w walked into a wine store in my section of Brooklyn and my wife, my wife is Asian. She's, uh, she's from Japan uh, and we have a son who's um, almost six and they were outside. And outside the wine shop, there was a little, like, I don't know, like little sign thing, you know, that said something on it, drink wine or whatever it said. And my wife and son were standing in front of that sign thing. And I went into the wine store and it was all glass. So you could see what was going on outside. And they were just looking at the sign. And uh, I think maybe my wife was encouraging my son to maybe read it or something or like that. It was a couple of months ago. And and I saw the, the, the woman who worked at the store. Um, I saw her, I did see her rush out, sort of like very quickly rush out towards my wife and son. And I was inside the store and, and then I saw her sort of gesticulating a bit towards them. I, but I wasn't sure what was going on. And I was looking at the one that I was looking at them, but she didn't touch them, but she was gesticulating a little bit. And my wife is also an artist, by the way. And she's, I, whatever, I don't know she's like I said this, but I think she's definitely a very sensitive person. And P.S. Um, I don't know what the heck she was doing, but she was initially, uh, I guess, saying, don't touch the sign to my wife and son, like it was very important that they don't touch the sign, but her energy was like, I'm gonna kill you if you touch the sign, at least according to my wife. And, and then she started like, you know, because it might be dirty that the, 
the birds poop on the sign and it, and she sort of tried to excuse herself and it affected my wife. It really had an impact on my life. And just a little addendum to the story is that uh, a couple of weeks before something else happened with a white woman uh, and my wife. Uh, and it, it wasn't necessarily political, but, and I don't know for sure, but, but my wife has, has now taken sort of more seriously the idea, even now after the election, that it would be kind of cool to leave the country and to move to another country and a, as an adventure, as a, as a place to maybe bring up our, you know, I can get emotional thinking about this for some reason. Because something does feel like it's changing. You know, and I'm in New York, and we're in New York City. You know, the, this liberal bash, this progressive, you know, supposedly progressive place. And, and I take it very seriously if, if my wife has that inclination. Um, I mean, obviously it has to do with other personal things about like getting a job and something like that, you know, um, and all that. And then, uh, yeah, I won't even bring up that. I mean, the other one, I'll, I'll just, it's very loaded, but I have an ultra Orthodox Jewish brother who I love, uh, but is an ultra Orthodox Jewish person and has many children. He has, he has six children. One of them is getting married this month. And he, you know, invited me to go. And he said some things about, you know, that are ridiculous about the, the virus. And that's a whole nother thing that I could take up the whole hour and try to develop a new show about. But, but, uh, but the complication about that, that I think is interesting for, for me is, is to love, is to actually love somebody who is, says, says and lives things that you hate and think are ridiculous and toxic and dangerous. So that's two things that are very intense uh, that I was more specific about, obviously with, with, with the first one, but both those things feel a bit both personal and, and political for me. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I guess a moment that kind of comes something like that, I, I mean, Nothing as strong as what you went through, you know. Uh, I don't got kids yet, but um, you know, when it when when all this was happening, like it felt kind of weird because it didn't feel so surprising and shocked as many people felt. You know, I don't know. I guess I kind of detached myself from everything. Like once things like this started getting, I, I kind of just kind of focused on myself and what I can control. But you know, obviously, it's a big deal, like in terms of the election and everything. And the map, I mean, I think it shocked everyone, that map, you know, when they saw it. And at the same time, I was kind of looking at it and I was kind of like, why would it be different? You know, what, 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 what was in place during this whole year of everything in 2020 to have led me to think that it would have been any, any different than how it turned out, right? Like, even when I saw it, I was like, I was like, I was just like, you know, I was kind of like, kind of like, wow, that's crazy. And I was like, I was like, is it really crazy? Not really, right? Like, when you look at the news and stuff and how divided things were, even up to the election, the way we talk to each other and stuff, yes, it'll be divided, right? And even, like, you know, it was just kind of, like, not surprising to me when people were looking at the polls and it was like, oh, the polls said this thing, but it's different. I'm like, yes, yeah, people lie, right? Like, I mean, you know, we live in a time where we're not really discussing, right? People just held to their strong views, you know, that some, that obviously are wrong, you know what I mean? And they're holding on to it so strong that, you know, we're not really seeing a clear picture. We can't preemptively see the clear picture, right? We're getting surprised by shit that sh we should have known, you know, and, and it's very precarious, right? Cause we, we kind of were sitting down relying on states that we would never want to go to. States where we call people stupid. It's like, yo, please vote for, please vote for Biden. Please, like, you know what I mean? And <laughs> it was kind of ironic, you know, in a sense. And also kind of scary when you think about it, right? Because like these places were like, yo, they're crazy, they ain't doing this, blah, blah. But at the same time, it's like, yo, please, yo, but, but for real, please, can you just just do this one real quick? Can you just vote, you know, vote for what's name and like let's win this and then we'll be good, you know what I mean? Um, so it's interesting and kind of you know, maybe think like we kind of have to really like come together in some shape, way, or form. At the end of the day, like we're dealing with a virus that came from a different country, right? 
And whatever my health is relies on how you handle it. So I got to care whether you like it, or whether I want to, not, whatever, you know, we, we just have to care, right? So I think that's like what's been hitting me more and more like of how to like actually care like in very different nuanced ways, instead of like, you know, you agree with me, I don't agree with you, X, Y, and Z, right? Um, but like on a human level, you know, I mean, obviously there's like things where it's like, yo, like that's that's obviously wrong. Why would you do that, right? But then like finding reasons why they come into that conclusion, like what what's happening, you know, like, like and finding it out in a sense of like, to really feel you like, yo, why why you really think this though? Not Not trying to, you know what I mean? Like, we all know what's wrong and stuff, but for real, like, why you really think that? And try to get to the root of the problem so we can, like, have a better pulse of, like, what's going on. Because right now we're in places where people saying things to look a certain way, right? Like, you know, let me say this so I don't get shamed or whatever, right? So you're not looking at the clear picture. I think it showed in the poll, right? We're supposed to be, this state supposed to be blue, this, that, whatever. You have places where they vote primarily for this person. You're like, wow, they really did? That's that's crazy. And it happened in like five, 10 different places, right? Which is crazy, you know? So I think um, in short, just kind of maybe like really think a little bit deeper below the service level, you know, like, you know, I mean, you know, you, you voted for this person, that person, you lie here, this and that, even if it hurts. But at the end of the day, you know, I think it's like important work because at the end of the day, we're relying on each other. I mean, shit, we was all glued to that map. Like, yo, please, please, this uh, <laughs> this red state turn blue, please. You know what I mean? Like, how crazy is that? That shit, re- that, that shit had an effect on what outcome we all wanted, right? So we have to care at the end of the day. Let's not wait for four years, then care. Let's do it now. So when we get to that point, that is no like, oh, no, 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 like we just finding things out like hodgepodge and stuff, you know what I mean? Juan. Hey, yes, thank you. Um, well, thank you for having me. First, I want to say, <laughs> great being here, great hearing you guys. Um, I'm, I'm thinking about messaging in general in in this current time and since the election, and I, <laughs> the debates. I mean, like, just doing a Georgia debate. I. It's interesting because I look at these debates and I'm like, what what are you saying? Sometimes I just want to go, what are you saying? What's the message? Huh? And I I I didn't I didn't uh, it, it felt like a B movie rate debate. I, does that even make like it was just like what is happening? And one didn't show up, what huh? And it was just I think about the messaging because even the person not being there at the podium is a message. And um so internalizing that, what does that mean for me? And I think about in this year, how we've all been absorbing. And I think we all talk about like technology and information and we're all absorbed so much more than we should. And, and I think about that in art, right? I think about that, like, wow, we're absorbing so much. Are we on overload? And I know some people can't create right now. Some people are creating so much. We're all in these different areas. And I find that fascinating. And I'm, I wonder, Some people enjoy art for escapism. Some people love their meaningful art. And I think I'm finding myself that I'm more of the meaningful art person, but I find my escapism fun kind of creeping up, right? And that's fascinating to me, right? That's so fascinating. I think that's happening to everybody a little bit. And that's fascinating to me because it's like, am I taking in a lot of art? Can that be bad? Can that be too much? Can my brain process it properly? Is what I'm really saying. And um, and if art is being reinvented and whether it's zoom or whatever it is that's exciting but then how about art itself as a practice are we reinventing that as well with everything that's going on and i think like well then if i'm gonna ask that question right as we're reinventing art and discovering and what do we have to say now in response to the old systems that didn't work for us when things go back to quote unquote returning Right? Are we going to return to that? Are we going to respond to that? Um, so I wonder about that, and I and and thinking of you know, so what's new? Or are we just going to repackage instead of reinvent? Right, and that's something that I that I keep thinking a lot about. And I'm, I'm, I'm writing without COVID in mind, but I wonder as I move forward, if we if it's so American to move forward, right? It's like oh, we got to keep going. 
got to figure it out. Whatever we got to do, we got to keep going. But then it's also so American to forget. So I wonder what that means if I continue to write without thinking about COVID. Am I forgetting something? And um, what needs to be artistically archived in this adventure we're going on in 2020? I don't know, you know, and do I even have the energy for it? And um, so I, I, I just think as like, as I'm, as should art be political, let's define what political means first. I think that means something different for everybody. And I think that um, before I can even reach that, I got to ask myself, do I feel like I have anything to say? Um, and, and quickly, that what that one thing you're talking about, like if there's a moment, I'm currently... I'm I my my twit not to not to promote shameless plug, but my IG handle is a one man show. So to play on my word, my name, like a one man show. And so the idea is like this last year or two, I'm sort of rethinking about myself and reinventing myself because I think it's time for all of us, not just me. And I'm currently trying to create a logo. And it took me some time to think of a logo. Who am I? What am I mean? What is my politics? Where am I? And I came up with sort of this silhouette of me that's in a suit but I gotta fit it in Tim's arm because that's me I'm a Bronx kid but I have this class and that's my political statement and and I'm revisiting that about myself and and I don't have an answer I feel like I'm just saying questions to you but that's that's this journey I'm on is sort of rediscovering just myself and it's kind of exciting but I got to keep asking myself making sure I don't miss anything along the way Hope that makes sense. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, Magali? There's so many questions here. I'm like, which one do I choose? Um, I've been responding to everything this year. Every um, initiative I've launched has been in response to the given circumstances. And I find myself at the end of the year um, processing. And now what? Right? And the now what is about figuring out somewhat similar to what Juan said. What is your end goal? And the end goal is an artist can somewhat be a response to the environment that you live in, but it can also be reimagining the world as you would like it. So do you simply be a, res a responder or a creator of new worlds? And so that's the question that I'm asking myself because I often, my style of writing, because in addition to acting, I, I write, is always about reimagining how the world could be better, <laughs> right? Because the world is not the way I want it to be. So let's create a world where everything is, finds a path to being better. And um, there is no easy path to being better. That's a quick fix. And we believed that, that would, there was an easy path to things being better. And it's that belief in the easy that led us to going nowhere and dealing with racial issues in this country that have existed since the beginning of the founding, founding of this nation, right? There's no, it's just the, the, the small choices that build up to a change and you can't stop making those small choices. And artistically, that will mean finding your voice and making a statement that you feel is a significant statement if you're the kind of artist who wants to create a whole new world that leads to a new world. <laughs> um, and um, figuring out what that new world would be, you know, whether there's a world where there, you, you can vote online or in person <laughs> or, <laughs> you know, the world that one created. Um, or just focusing on what is right now and truly looking at it and not pretending it's not there, but looking at it and finding your version of a solution that is perhaps not within the purview of the imaginable. 
And that I think that is the one thing that perhaps our society never really allowed themselves to go beyond the imaginable. And perhaps that will be my goal. Not quite sure, but the year is ending with assessing how else will I serve, serve the world, both as a creator and as a producer of work. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Magali. Um, Lorraine? Um, there's a lot. <laughs> um, I've been thinking a lot about um, everything that's been said, but I also really like the questions that you, um, you had given initially. Um, I guess, so, when when you say art and politics to me it's just art because art is political um art is never not political um and that's because life is political and art is a reflection of life um and so there's no there's no neutrality. There's no being unbiased. Humans are inherently biased no matter what. Um, and so, and that that's reflected in everything that we do and, and our perspective in life, um, how we think about things, how we regard other people, how we conduct our relationships and our businesses. And that's all in how we do our art as well. Um, and I was thinking a lot about, because um, Juan brought up escapism and Magli brought up creating new worlds. So I actually, I love fantasy and sci-fi. Um, and one of my favorite things is Star Trek. Um, like Star Trek to me is the ideal world, right? Um, and even then it's not like 100% perfect. I mean, they still wage wars and they still colonize planets, et cetera. So it's like, it's not perfect, but in terms of a united earth, you know, something like that, that's to me, that's great. Um, and that is a very political franchise show when it's first started. Um, and what's funny to me is somewhere along the way people kind of forgot about that and then you know a new star trek show came out recently with um a black woman as a lead and people got mad about that and uh and oh but her name is michael why does she have a guy's name that's weird so you know uh there there's there's still a lot of fighting um there's still a lot of people fighting the fact that art is isn't always has been and always will be political it's a it's a reflection of our lives um but yeah it's also a platform to show possibilities of futures um that are better than the realities we live in right now um and so and even um, even not like, not even thinking about sci-fi, but like fantasy based on medieval worlds and stuff. Um, you know, in, in a medieval world where like women are treated more equally than they were in real medieval times, like that's still, that's political. Or even if you choose to tell um, a medieval story where women are treated like shit like they were in real life but you know you didn't have to do that because you're making it up that is a choice that you make you know there there are always little choices that you make in art that is a reflection of your politics of your own personal politics so um anyway i think 
um, where I was trying to get with this is because um, I really like the question of how do you respond to this moment as an artist? And so um, there's this political commentator that I watch all the time. Um, and uh, his, his, uh, his view is that the way that you bring people in is by being kind um, and being open to teach. If, if you see someone who's genuinely asking questions, um, don't get angry that they don't know, answer their questions. But you know that's assuming that they're not asking those questions in bad faith, but that's a different story. But, um, but I mean, art is one of the ways that we bring people in as well. Um, and so I think to be, to, to, to show people great possible futures in, in our art, um, or even just showing ourselves who we are, that we're all human and we have different experiences, but, um, you know, we still share struggles um, or we still share traits. Um, we, we all, you know, we all get upset with our partners or our parents or, you know, telling our stories through small moments like that. Um, anything really from, from the smallest moments to the biggest fantasy worlds, I think, um, I, I, as soon, I think as soon as we get rid of the notion that art is not polit or art shouldn't be political or art is not political, um, or this is political, but that's not, um, I think is when we can bring even more people in. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, John Martin. Okay. Um, hmm. Where are we now? We are where we have been. We are in the cauldron of white supremacy. We are in the matrix of white supremacy. Um, I am um, listening and um, I, yeah, I love uh, what you guys are talking about, um, you know, where, um, Juan, you talk about reinvention, um, um, Magali, Magali, you talk about the possibility of inventing um, something or imagining new um, vistas, new new experiences that, that we can live in that we, or live out. Um, um, you too, Lorraine. Um, yeah, uh, what I, where I am, I am, I am both frustrated and excited. Um, I'm frustrated um, less than I am excited, thankfully. Um, I'm frustrated that um, this moment, this political moment that we are living through um, smacks very much to me of, of the, um, well, particularly when we met a month ago, you know, just before the election, um, what we've been through, what we've just, what we're, what we're coming to the end of with 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 Donald's, um, uh, I don't want to call it a president, his, his non-presidency, his his fake presidency, his fraudulent presidency, um, is is like the reaction to the um, reconstruction. You know, of 150 or so years ago, um, and uh, 
and and that's where you you have you you're onto something I too think too Abhishek, where you talk about the the polarities and 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 veering back and forth things not staying where if things go too far in one direction politically there's like an equal and opposite reaction um but i think we've stayed in the same place in terms of what i perceive as these um art, these these arbitrary artificial hierarchies hierarchical structures that we that we live under the 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 chief one among well there are a couple actually male and female you know because this is a um, patriarchy um, that's founded on misogyny that's that's one but but white supremacy and it occurs to me what I feel excited and hopeful about is that it occurs to me that the way that we can change this dynamic, even as 57% um, of white people, <laughs> of all whites voted for Donald, 57%. <laughs> even so, it occurs to me that we can change this dynamic by um, changing our relationship to it. And I'm thinking about African descended people now, particularly. Um, um, I think that we have to step out of the matrix. We have to step out of the hierarchical structure that has been given us, that has been bequeathed us. Um, and um, so that's what I'm working on creatively and, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm writing. And like you, David, I'm attempting to discipline myself to write um, in focused and, and, and cogent fashion so that I can um, articulate this which I'm seeing, which makes a lot of sense to me. I, 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 I think if we step outside of the paradigm we've been handed, you know, if we change our relationship to, to the, the hierarchical structure that we've been operating under, um, that everybody else will have to follow suit. And so that's what I'm working on. That's where I am and that's what I'm working on. Thank you so much. I, I, I wish we had more time because I wouldn't mind hearing a little more about stepping out. Ah. <laughs> um, uh, Abhishek? Hi, um, thank you for inviting me. Um, I, sh I guess I should have said that earlier. Anyways, um, yeah, so you said share something that came to your mind like suddenly, right? So something happened with me. I came out of a coffee shop, you know, like with no thoughts about what's going on in the world, uh, lost in my own thoughts. And as soon as I step out of the coffee shop, out of nowhere, there's a bull mastiff dog someone's dog just like is leaping on me and my first response is like run like I'm just running around cars it's, it was like a parking lot I was running around cars and the dog is like after me I, I somewhat knew that it's not it's not gonna bite me but I still like my 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 like primary response was to just run away and just like <laughs> and everybody who was around started laughing on me and I was like feeling like so embarrassed at the same time but at the same time, I also started laughing at me that why I like I'm 31 year old and I'm running from a dog like this. I used to do this when I was like five or seven. <laughs> and, you know, like and it, this was a dog of some guy who was putting it, him into a, like a like a cage like thing because he was trying to ship it to somewhere. I don't know. Uh, but it just leaped out of the uh, of the cage. And maybe the dog didn't want to go there. And just he was like running around like, <laughs> you know, he just thought. He just saw me running and you know like how dogs are they start chasing things that run from them so yeah so that that, that was an experience uh, a fun but embarrassing one um, okay so the questions were uh, where are we the first one yeah so uh, we are at a uh, we as humans who live in america i'm going to include myself because right now i'm here um your camera went out i'm a shy. 
Oh, actually, I was re reading the questions from the chat. Okay, oh, so where okay. are we? We are we are at a very polarized place um, as a group of people, um, seeing things with a very very different perspective. Uh, uh, I also um just just wanted to conclude the story. So I'm I, I, it doesn't matter. I'm 31. I'm still a fool. So whatever I say, maybe. I don't know what I'm saying, so I'm just a, just a, another fool. Uh, yeah. So what I think is we are at a very polarized place um, as a country. We see things from a very different perspective, um, um, and uh, I guess the primary motive for us as humans to do something is uh, our. I mean, you might not acknowledge that, but our personal benefit uh, mostly. 99.99% of the time, maybe there are some people who are just elevated, who have this got like some higher understanding of the things. I don't know about that, but we are motivated by our ben personal benefits, by the way. This is how I think, or our group benefits. Um, now the second question was, um, where uh, uh, where do you find yourself? I I I I find myself in a very insignificant insignificant place right now because I'm not doing anything actively to change anything. Um, I can make a choice, but we can't um, see you. Yeah, you're, I mean, we can hear you, but you you you're, you're gone again. If if that's what you want, um, you uh, okay. I, I I just take the question. So um, I I. Yes, so I was saying that I I I, I see at a very myself as a at a very insignificant place because I am not doing anything to change anything actively. I can make a choice to not do that, but I think right now I have work to work on myself. So I want to work on myself right now. I think I need to work on myself, and I'm not qualified enough or capable enough i guess to work on the world as an artist however uh, the third okay uh, the third question was where where do we go from here uh that is that and the fourth question how what can we do as an artist is the same thing because i cannot decide where the other people would like to go but i can decide for myself where would i like to go and uh we have an we have something special we have a special power as an artist. Uh, the one thing that I learned, which I remember very distinctively after coming to HB Studio as an actor is never judge the character. Uh, <laughs> I was judging the character in the play called Seagull. <laughs> Some, somebody just uh, kills himself for a girl. And I was like, how can somebody kill themselves for a girl? And I was like, I asked the question and the teacher was like, <laughs> never judge the character. <laughs> so, so that was something that stuck to me. And I, every time that that line gives me new meanings in life. So I'm going to use the same thing. I'm not going to judge anybody for how they see things. I don't know what their position is. I don't know where they are coming from. I don't know what their upbringing is. I don't know what type of conditions they have been grown up in. So um, I'm, I'm just going to try to convince through my art, uh, through my writing, through my performance, I think as an actor, that's what we can do and that's where we can go from here. Uh, the people who do not think like us uh, are also humans. Uh, doesn't matter how, you know, like outrageous their thoughts are. Um, we can still try to reason with them as much as possible. And art is a very strong thing um, to do that. A very capable thing to do that. Uh, I think you. There's nothing else more powerful. Uh, you, you muted yourself. I think. Yeah, you go. Uh, okay. There's nothing else more powerful than art that can change someone's mind. And about the hierarchy, I would just say that yes, there are hierarchies in the world. Uh, nothing can exist without a hierarchy. Uh, you muted. Sorry, your... I'm getting a call. I'm getting a call. Nothing can exist without a hierarchy, uh, but the base on which the hierarchy was created is competence in my understanding. So that's something I'll look more into. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Abhishek. Edith? Yeah. 
my mind is going near, 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 near. Um, hmm. I, you know, a, a, a very impo- important moment for me, and it really preceded this whole thing. It happened this summer. Um, I was reading a book, uh, and this is a book um, by Charles Burnett. Do I have that right? No. Charles Chestnut, called Marrow. Um, and I was led to it. Um, because Pat Golden, who's doing this project about Lorraine Hansberry, came became interested in an unpublished play of Lorraine Hansberry's that uh, she never finished, but she was working on Marrow. So I thought, let me read this novel. Um, and the novel um, tracked back to um, other incidents that Pat was interested in history where there was an uprising to put um, uh, a black community, black business community down. And one of those happened to happen after the 1918 flu epidemic apparently. So there are these moments in history and they started popping up in history as we started investigating this. Um, And I sat down to read Marrow um, and my father's from the south. My my father's mother, um, his father his father was from Mississippi. His mother was from um, Alabama. So I have a long history, but it's a kind of a remote history with the in with the south because I grew up in the north. Um, but the kind of center point of this novel, in the back room of this white newspaper editors business. Um, The white men in the town, kind of the white leaders in the town, meet to figure out how to undermine an election. Um, I hope I'm getting the history of it right. Uh, To keep it from happening. Um, Or to keep the um, black citizens uh, from coming out for this election. And this is you know, this is Reconstruction era. Um, they're Southern Democrats. This is the Democratic Party way back when. And the certainty that they were doing something that they really must do in order to kind of keep a, you know, keep things organized. There was just the sense of, you know, justice that was um, came to, it, it came to, it was so familiar. It came to me as so familiar. It, 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 it pinged all of these things that I knew but didn't know. Um, and reading the book was right like reading poison. That's that. That's how it felt to read that novel. It was to to read poison because there were things being exposed that we really haven't wanted to expose. Um, so that that book has tracked through my year. That experience on my summer vacation of sitting down, you know, on a porch and reading that book has tracked through my year, um, and um, it's kind of put all kinds of pieces together for me. Um, Things about my childhood that hadn't been able to surface or understand or put together. Um, And then, you know, something about my grandfather came up, my uh, my grandfather, my father's dad, telling a long story, please forgive me, um, who was, um, uh, had to leave school when he was in elementary school uh, because his father was injured. Um, so he ended his education. Um, and then he became a school teacher in the South uh, with a third grade education because they needed teachers. 
So what is that telling me about the South? What is that telling me about that world? I, I don't know yet, but suddenly there are these details that I'm accessing about that whole history that mean different things to me now. Um, I'm a student of history. I, I was a student of history in school, a student of cultural history and of the history of ideas. Um, and, and as an actor, my practice has always been to, to take the pieces apart and try to examine the circumstances and see, you know, what is this really telling us? What is the new thing that I can understand out of all of these circumstances that I thought I, you know, I thought I had them. I thought, oh, you know, they're right and they're wrong. This is, this is good and this is bad. It's, I think I, I think I've got the kind of the gloss of that um, set of circumstances, but I don't. And, you know, and, and wandering into the details of that, um, uh, give me a new life, give me a new understanding, give me a new set of possibilities. Um, and, and, and if you will bear with me, I'm going to read a little thing um, that I inherited from my mother, David, after she passed. It was, um, it's, a, it's a statement she wrote about an exhibition of paintings that she had, she was a visual artist. Um, and it's, it's been a kind of a guide to me um, ever since I started trying to lead this organization and this school. Um, I hope it tracks the way I think it tracks for me. Um, she wrote, to love life is to give its details focus in their essential individuality. And to know life is to relate the details to their frame so that loving and knowing are interchangeable. The vicious circle is broken by the incongruous and points us toward new forms and a new molding of clay and spirit under the Omega's arch. The artist's task is to imagine the process, to keep the books, to record gain and loss. Martha Meeks. Wow, she was amazing. Wow. Holy cow, that was amazing. Did you, did you want to say anything else? Uh, 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 no? Okay, okay. Uh, um, thank you all so, so much. And that was amazing. I want that quote, if you don't Me mind. Me too. I'd love you to send that if, if on the wall. you don't mind. Wow. I think it was a really interesting. That's that's like Emerson. <laughs> it really is. It's a puzzle. It really is. Like, it, wow. It is. It's amazing. Um, and, you know, I, I, I also think this was amazing. And I want to say why, just because, you know, you know, we're living, just the world is so filled with uh, clicks, you know, and, and desires for, lots of clicks or, or lots of attention or lots of real, real things that, that are, you know, so many people want. And, and, you know, I watched that, I watched that, um, I don't know, I think, I think Juan, you were, you may have been alluding to the debate in Georgia. Uh, uh, and and I, I don't know if any of you did, but last night I watched the U on YouTube, the one debate. And I mean, I mean, it just speaks to like, what is going on here? And I'm, I just bring it up because this format of just being, just being, everybody being quiet and one person just go, <laughs> you know what I mean? And then everybody else be quiet and somebody else just go. And everybody go, and just go. I think it's, I think it's really a beautiful format. And, and I don't know how entertaining it is for anybody that's still watching out there necessarily, but I think it's important. And I guess I'm, I'm curious 
if we were to bring into the mix some folks who think differently and then a lot of us in here and but had the same format uh, and maybe different prompts and maybe different things to explore uh, and different you know groups whatever and 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 I'm interested in doing that myself uh, both with HB and with my own company ensemble force and and uh, just because uh, it's political to sit and listen to somebody else with your time, with your life. And I think that in itself, I just wanna thank you, Edith, and I wanna thank everyone for, for, for spending your time tonight. And I, I, I hope to see you again uh, s s sooner than later. So thank you again. Thank you so much for your time. And thank HB Studio and Edith and all of you. Uh, I, I, really, I really appreciate it. Really. Have a beautiful end of the year, everyone. Thank you. Yes. Have a beautiful end of year and safe. And and what's that? Oh no, I'm, you, no, I'm sorry. Go ahead. You no, no, what were you gonna say? What were you gonna say? No, I was saying you guys too. Yeah, you too, Magdalene, Mag Mag everybody. Wow. Thank you, John Martin. Yeah. Yeah. Have a share. Lorraine, Lorraine, Edith. Thank you. Juan, Edith. Have a great night. Have a great night, everybody. Have a great new year. Much love to you. And and uh hope to see you again soon. And thank you, anybody who, who was watching. Thank you so much for the time, your time as well. All right. Uh, all right. So I guess we can stop recording. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Thank you.